We're sadly coming to the end of our second series of the podcast with me, Mel Sainsbury and Nature's Menu, the UK and Europe's leading expert in raw and natural pet food. Throughout our second season, we've discussed the post-pandemic pup, how to enjoy life after lockdown with your new furry friend and the best ways to introduce your dog to new people and pets. If you've missed the trend of buying or adopting a puppy over the last year, you might be feeling the fear of missing out. But when it comes to breeds, should you just go for the cutest dog out there or should you dig a little deeper to find out more about your potential pup? Today, I'm joined by Sarah Smith, one of Puppy School's very talented tutors. Sarah is here to chat to us about the best ways to choose the right breed for your family. Is it the case that all dogs are completely individual or can certain temperaments and behaviours be attributed to breed? What do potential new pup owners need to be aware of? So thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Lovely. So I think we'll start off with the basics, really. Can you explain to us what the main type of dog breed groups are? Often we sort of see them banded around when we're watching or attending things like Crufts. But what are the main breed of dog groups and how are they sort of divided up into those groups? Sure. So um, sort of based upon the Kennel Club UK grouping, um, and as you say, very familiar people have seen these with crufts and things like that. So there are kind of seven main groups that different dog breeds fall into. Um, The first being the hound group. This is a group that was originally bred for hunting by the use of scent or sight. So they typically would include the breeds like a greyhound, a dash hound, a beagle, those sorts of breeds of dogs. Then the next group, we have the working dog group. This tends to be larger breeds. This is typically termed as um, dogs that are used to help people. So for example, in like search and rescue. So they would include things like the St. Bernard, but also you have things like the Boxer, the Doberman, the Great Dane, which um, are, are becoming quite popular in terms of family pets, and they would be included in that working group. Then the next group is the terrier group. These were originally bred to sort of chase and catch vermin, so they very much had a job to do. Um, And as the name of the group would suggest, they include things like the West Highland Terrier, the Border Terrier, so sort of the terrier families, really. Then we have the gun dog group. These are dogs that were traditionally used for hunting and retrieval um, and still are today in some times. So they would include things like the Labrador Retriever, Cocker Spaniel, the Springer Spaniel, those sorts of groups of working dogs in terms of gun dog training. And then we have our fifth group, which is the pastoral group. These are breeds of dogs that work with livestock. So very typically the Border Collie, the German Shepherd, those sorts of groups. Then we have the utility group. These contain a lot of mixed sizes of breeds. So there's quite a variety in this group. Um, It's termed officially as dogs with a fitness for purpose. So it's quite often breeds that perhaps maybe don't quite fit into the other groups, but they still have a fitness for some sort of purpose with their breeding. So for example, um, on the small end side, you might have a Shih Tzu moving into sort of the the more medium breeds like the Bulldogs, um, and then working up to things like Dalmatians and obviously Poodles, which can be from sort of the the miniature right up to the giants and then the final group is the toy group and as its name would suggest this is termed the small companion group so this you'll have things like pugs pomeranians those sorts of types of breeds brilliant lovely thank you for that description that's really cool do you think every breed in those groups sort of display typical behaviors of that particular group so for example Do you think every terrier in the terrier group is likely to run out the front door and catch a rat or a small prey animal or can they differ within their own individual groups? I think there's an element of both with that, if I'm honest. I mean, yes, the breeds within these groups have similar traits, which is why they've been grouped together quite collectively. However, you know, even within every breed, within every litter of puppies, there's obviously differences. So, yes, terriers probably you might see it in terms of their play style in that they might like to do a lot of what we call shake and kill, where where they um, play with things and they toss them around and they'll play with their toys in that way, which is part of their natural instinct. But also, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they're then going to run out the door and go and chase the neighbourhood cat or try and catch a rat, you know, out and about. 
certainly I remember um, having gun dogs as a, a child and one of them I, I had two at the time red setters gun dogs and one was absolutely fine and pretty much bomb proof and took everything in his stride and the other one one loud noise my god he would be on his bed a shaking absolute wreck so would have made pretty rubbish gun dog I think all in all but was lovable at the same time so yeah I can definitely vouch that they they differ between the groups that's for sure oh, wow. um, <laughs> do you think that owners should be aware of the different groups and sort of the the things that are associated with the different groups before they should go shopping for a puppy or do you think it's just a case of having a look at a breed and thinking yep I love that it's really cute or or it's got lovely wrinkles so I think that will definitely suit me I think research is absolute key you know research 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 so yes be aware of maybe the groupings of maybe some of the breeds that you're leaning towards. See which group they sort of come under and what those typical traits might be as a collective, but then dig deeper into that breed. You know, people will ask me, well, how do you go about choosing a breed? And I'll quite often say to people, don't try not to have your heart set on one particular breed. Do your research around it. Have you got maybe two or three types that you might go actually that's quite similar I'd be interested in looking a bit further into that because supply and demand for litters of puppies and especially breed specific puppies at this current time is quite high and obviously a lot of owners find that they get disappointed or they might be tempted then to go for something even though it might not be quite right for them so I think as much research as you can do will really set you up for making some good choices. Brilliant yeah I think it's about Personal circumstance as well, isn't it? I mean, if you're living in a house and you've got 14 indoor rabbits, then maybe a terrier isn't the route that you want to go down. I mean, not saying it's not impossible to train a terrier, not to chase a bunny, but it's going to be slightly more difficult than your stereotypical lab, I would imagine. Would that be right? Absolutely. As you quite rightly say, you can train and work around these things, but definitely lifestyle, um, typical circumstance of, of the owners, you know, that has to impact in, in any choices that they make moving forward in terms of selecting a breed or selecting a puppy that they think is ideal for them. Definitely. And if you don't like walking, then maybe looking at a dog that doesn't like walking either, <laughs> which is always a big mistake that I see. They say, oh, he's got so much energy. And you think, well, it's because the dog needs exercise. It's not really a surprise. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I have two huskies at home and uh, yeah, I exercise. Oh, a lot. yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, do you know what the most popular dog breed is at the moment? And do you know why that is? I mean, obviously, we've just come out the other side of uh, block lockdown and hopefully coming to the end of COVID now and have you seen a rise in particular breeds or dog breeds or do you know which one is the most popular registered with the kennel club? Yeah I do typically Labrador is normally within the top three um, year on year um, last year that changed slightly that the Labrador retriever was knocked off the top spot by the French bulldog and I think that was because of an insurgence of sort of a lot of people finding a love for the breed and so it became quite on trend however for 2020 moving into 2021 Labradors are back on the top spot and to be honest I think probably the reasoning behind that is Labradors can serve a lot of different functions from what owners might need from them as a breed so typically they're quite often recommended for being a good family breed you know so that if people have got young children or there's children in the family you know a nice docile Labrador will happily you know dote on the fuss and the attention um, however because they are part of the gun dog groupings you know they can also be used to train for sort of gun dog activities or hunting if that's sort of the route that the owners choose to go down as well so they're quite versatile really I've also um, with my training it's very rare I don't come across a food motivated Labrador so it also makes it uh, easier to train <laughs> a hungry labrador is never such thing as a full labrador is there <laughs> no never <laughs> yes yeah, surgeons of um a couple of other breeds of dogs actually that have come out as being a little bit more on trend for sort of the end of last year coming into this year is the jack russell terrier and also the corgi which is rather interesting Oh, lovely. Yeah, because I know the corgi was in decline, wasn't it? So that's lovely, actually. That's coming back. That's really good. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, we're focusing quite a lot on um, kennel club registrations, etc. But um, obviously, they don't register sort of crossbreeds and things. So what would you say about 
crossbreeds and sort of researching those do you think just research the more dominant breeds say you've got three quarters of one breed and a quarter of another breed or is it important to sort of try and trace as many breeds as you can to do with that particular puppy what would be your tips on crossbreeds so on crossbreeds I think again you know if you can research as much as possible then it's going to give you a better idea of what some of the potential temperaments behaviors might be you know I mean with, with some rescues or there are puppies in rescue as well as older dogs you know and sometimes we don't always know what their mixes are um, so you know if you've only got the dominance sort of guess as to what that might be then obviously of course you have to go on the, the information that you've got but if you've got more of an idea or you're going to a breeder and say, you know, you're, you're looking at a cockapoo, which is a mixture of, you know, the cocker spaniel crossed with the poodle. I would definitely look at both types because, you know, different breeds have different temperaments. They have different traits and personalities. And obviously, you know, those, those may have potential to show through, even if one of the crossbreeds is more prevalent, as you say. So say it's more sort of three quarters this and only a quarter of that. It's still a quarter worth of bearing in mind because you may start to see some of those behaviours, even as the puppy grows and goes through adolescence and into adulthood some of those traits might start to slowly come through mm, okay no that's really interesting because I know there's a lot of of crossbreeding going on not that there's anything wrong with crossbreeds because I have a very handsome one myself so um yeah I certainly think that's worth researching like you say all aspects of the breeds that are involved if you possibly can Nature's Menu is dedicated to the health and well-being of its pets and yours. Discover the world of raw and more by visiting naturesmenu.co.uk. The Pupcast podcast is offering an exclusive 20% discount to its listeners. Simply enter Pupcast20 at the naturesmenu.co.uk checkout. Can you think of any breeds that sort of spring to mind that impact personality, of easiness of training, general intelligence? I know from sort of personal experience and obviously I would imagine there's going to be listeners out there that say oh no you're wrong you're wrong but I know that chows are known to be quite aloof um, and they're not sort of uh, people dogs I would say generally they're, they're quite sort of happy to get on with life on their own and not really bothered about their owners much of the time but can you think of any other sort of more common breeds that have difference in personality and easiness of training etc so I think, first of all, just my personal experience and from teaching in classes and training with puppies, a food motivated puppy is makes it slightly easier to train. It's not impossible with a puppy that's maybe more toy focused or people focused, but actually one that will work for food makes it a little bit easier. So again, coming back to sort of the Labradors, um, but also Golden Retrievers are also, you know, um, I think sometimes they're a little bit overshadowed by Labradors. They're also great family dogs and also very um, easy to train in terms of sort of um, intelligence wise you know obviously you have your border collies your German shepherds very sharp very quick to pick things up however you've got to bear that in mind that um, if you want to go down that route you know you're going to have to spend a lot of time and energy to help channel that because you know they pick things up very quickly and then it's like right what's on to the next thing you know you can sort of <laughs> almost see them going okay what now give me something else now you know um, so you know if, if you sort of go down that route you've just got to be careful that you know actually you are meeting those needs of that particular puppy um i get a lot of spaniels coming through in class and sort of the cockapoo so actually the, the poodle side is is very um intelligent sort of side of species um that said you know i mean you can argue that any any breed <laughs> it can be easy to train <laughs> it's just how well you and the time and effort that you put in <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of any, um, sort of going along those lines as well, could you think of any illnesses or hereditary diseases that people should be mindful of with particular breeds? Or if not, how can they check? I mean, we all want the best for our dogs. We all want a happy, healthy dog. But unfortunately, we do know that things sometimes go wrong. So what's the best way to sort of prevent that from happening, do you think? Okay, so when looking for sort of in particular a puppy and making sure that they are completely as healthy as physically possible, certainly I know the Kennel Club insist on what they call certain health scores, sort of certificates that breeders have to make sure that they have and that they have to produce to show to potential puppy owners that want to buy puppies. Um, again, even if you're not going down the pedigree route and the Kennel Club route, you know, actually it's worth asking those sorts of questions. What's the history? So for example, thinking about just for me, 
with, with my Huskies, you know, actually hip scores for them because hip dysplasia can be a, quite a common ailment for them where, you know, where the bone isn't quite sitting in the joint socket. For other examples, I mean, different breeds have different health traits, you know. So, for example, sort of the King Charles Cavalier Spaniel, very much thinking about the health of the eyes, the ears, the nose. Um, any sort of brachiocephalus, so sort of squished faced as they're nicknamed um, breeds, so like the French bulldog, the pug, those sorts of things, very much, you know, the questions that a potential puppy owner should be asking is, you know, sort of connected around sort of the length of the, the muzzle, making sure that it's not so squished that the puppy's uh, struggling to breathe, or if they're looking at the mum or the dad and thinking, oh, you know, maybe asking the breeder, oh, is there any medical history of any breathing ailments? Is there any history of this? You know, ha have you got some sort of medical certificate or score to prove that you know that actually they're at the best as they can be type of thing lovely I think that's brilliant advice and I think also just to add to that um, from my veterinary background it's really important that people understand the scores as well that they're being given I always remember one example that we had um, of a young dog that has absolutely horrible hips I mean we x-rayed it because he was lame and he turned out to, to have really bad hips and we asked the owners um, when you purchased him a couple of years ago did you ask about hip scores and they said oh yeah both parents were hip scored well what was their score oh I don't know and it turns oh. out that both the parents had absolutely diabolical hips as well but because bless the owners they just said oh he has he been hip scored that was just a tick mark for them and they didn't understand the scoring system so yeah I think it's definitely worth researching that and like you say kennel club is probably the best place to go um, for things like that so you can understand what actual school will mean etc before you just tick it off your list and say yeah that's all been done that's all hunky-dory is there a healthiest breed do you think is there a, a breed that you sort of see regularly that don't really tend to have problems or is it just potluck Oh, this one's a contentious one. The impossible lots question. Of, lots of people <laughs> listening going, no. <laughs> um, I think traditionally a lot of people always said the crossbreeds could potentially be healthier than sort of um, some of the pedigree breeds just because they have sort of the, the genes from more than one breed type going in. And whether that's medically true, I don't know. Um, you might know more than me, actually, uh, from a veterinary <laughs> perspective. But, um, you know, certainly... Um, um, the crossbreeds or the, the traditional mongrel, as they were called, um, tend to be ones. I mean, I, I have one of my own, bless her, who's a crossbreed, you know, and actually out of the four of my dogs, she's the healthiest. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'm a bit biased. The puppies that I see, majority of my puppies come through, you know, they're sort of aged between eight and 20 weeks when they start training classes. So I would hope that actually at that time I don't see huge issues you know mm. um, and I'm just trying to think back over my years with puppy school whether I have seen anything don't think I actually have really had any thing that's caused me too much concern sometimes owners will ask me what do you think about this about how they're you know maybe how they're walking slightly or you know what about their gait and and to be honest I always say refer back to your vet early identification is far better than leaving it I also remember reading from the super vet Noel Fitzpatrick that the reason he chose a border terrier as his choice of dog breed was because they were the breeds of dogs that he saw the least coming into mm. practice so yeah, I can 100% agree with that with Border Terriers. That there's always a bit of a standing joke in practice that Border Terriers do seem to bounce. I mean, they have the <laughs> most brilliant accidents, the most brilliant agricultural accidents of things like, oh, he fell off the tractor or he, he fell off the combine harvester when I was doing the field. And you just think uh, any other breed of dog would just shatter into a million pieces. But Border Terriers, no, bounce off the ground, get back up again, off we go, let's do the next thing. So yeah, I can definitely <laughs> agree with that from that, that point of view. I think also from my experience working at Nature's Menu, I mean, diet is just so yeah. so important isn't it and keeping them an ideal weight and making sure they don't get overweight and it's really interesting actually that you mentioned earlier on about food motivated dogs um and there's always uh, i know with my experience there's always a lot of paranoia with puppy owners when you're saying use treats for training use treats treat that treat this yeah. treat that treat this and you always generally get that answer of oh well, I don't want to feed too many treats because he might get overweight and I'm really paranoid about his weight 
and you just sort of think you've got to balance this out do you want a well-behaved puppy or do you want a really naughty puppy that's nice and skinny and you can balance it out quite easily I think and you, you just need to sort of weigh out how many treats you're giving and compare that to the normal daily food but yeah I think it's really important with diet and treat rewarding etc cetera, etc cetera, and just keeping them nice and healthy as much as you possibly can isn't it absolutely you know and and having a good quality treat you know and something that smells a Healing. you know you can buy sort of cheaper versions of biscuity things but they're not always going to necessarily work for the puppy so something kind of meaty and nice and tasty so for example the uh, you know the, the puppy treats that nature's menu mm. do are absolutely perfect you know they're always a hit in puppy classes so as your puppy grows and gets older you know their needs are going to change and and I think sometimes um quite often maybe with older dogs sort of owners forget that maybe oh well they're not exercising quite as much so they probably don't need quite as much in their portion size (laughs) yeah definitely (laughs) I can vouch for that personally actually myself Um, yes no 100% agree with that yeah and like you say the the motivation of the treats as well I mean some things I, I remember when I took my first dog to training classes and I had so many people in the class say to me oh he never takes his eyes off you your dog he's just he's so in love with with you and I just remember thinking he's not he just wants these treats because he absolutely loves them he adores them and that's what he's working for and these poor people were sort of turning up with a handful of biscuits that they would normally feed at dinner time and their puppies were like no way that that yeah. lady over there smells incredible I'm going over there so yeah, absolutely it's, it's quite funny to see how they change isn't it as soon as you <laughs> offer them something that's more tasty they're like oh yes I'll do anything for that thank you <laughs> yeah yeah I was exactly the same when I took my first uh, four to um classes you know I'd have like three bags of different stuff (laughs) it would be like just sit there and be like yeah whatever you want (laughs) yeah Yeah. those other dogs could be doing cartwheels behind me I don't care this lady has cheese (laughs) this is brilliant (laughs) can you explain to us why some breeds are so expensive now I know this is something that we have been made aware of during lockdown with the puppy demands and people sort of after thousands and thousands for particular breeds but in general terms do you have any idea why certain breeds are so expensive? I mean as you quite rightly say I think the um, sort of demand for puppies during lockdown increased and so breeders um, kind of went woohoo um, and so obviously prices for puppies have shot up quite dramatically Price increases can also occur where you have a particular breed that is particularly trendy at that time. So, for example, last year, because the French Bulldog was particularly on trend, prices for French Bulldogs suddenly hit an all time high. Sadly, as we've mentioned previously, that, you know, there are some breeds that are put on the endangered list or at risk of sort of, you know, slowly phasing out. And so obviously, you know, for for breeders of those particular breeds, you know, actually they justify, well, you know, we're trying to keep the breed going. And so therefore, actually, that might also have an impact. Um, You can also have it where you know, if there's been sort of any extra costs or undue costs, maybe that breeders had to have whilst um, raising the litter, um, they will factor that in. Um, obviously, with the law on microchipping that's changed, breeders now have to microchip their puppies before they are allocated or sold to owners who then have to pay to then change the registration fees. So that's something else, you know, just sort of the, the ongoing inflation costs of things as well. But I think probably the key one is sort of um, what's the demand and if there's a high demand then I think that's when the prices start to go really high and Mm. that can affect particular breeds at particular times yeah definitely and I think again like you said earlier on it's about doing your research because litters are not cheap to raise they're not a quick buck for for most sensible good breeders they're not a quick buck are they they're they're very expensive to raise if you're feeding them on a good quality diet, you've got to increase that food for the bitch while she's pregnant. You've then got to think about feeding the puppies when they're born. Maybe the bitch had to have a cesarean for whatever reason, which is obviously going to put your veterinary costs up. Sometimes these puppies need hand feeding if the mum hasn't got enough milk, et cetera, et cetera. And the costs are extortionate. If you're going to raise a litter properly, it is an expensive hobby to have. And I know a lot of good breeders out there make a very, very small profit when they actually calculate down all their expenses 
expenses, which sometimes is hard to believe when you see the prices of puppies. But when you consider all their costs that they have incurred from a pregnant bitch to even stud fees to registration, as you say, the microchipping, some of them have them vaccinated. The profit that they actually make on each individual puppy is pretty small. And a lot of them are just doing it for the love, I think, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, and anybody thinking of trying to find a breeder, you know, there's a really great little website, which is um, buyingapuppy-thinkmeg.com, which actually, you know, can help potential owners to go, okay, the Meg basically stands for M is mom, look at mom, look at mom with a litter of puppies, you know, and any good reputable breeder, as you say, you'll you'll instantly see it you know they'll be energetic they'll be happy you know is mum attentive to them um the e is environment so what environment are they being raised in you know if if you go and they're just shoved in a barn out the back you know you might raise a few questions whereas most really good you know reputable breeders and there are loads out there you know they'll do lots to already start to expose those puppies to lots of positive experiences before they've even found owners and before they leave home type of thing you know and Mm -hmm. obviously the g is just genetics which we've already talked about so absolutely as you say there's so much that um, in terms of costs actually that if a good breeder is doing it right the margin is very small Mm, yeah so do you have um, a number one dog breed that would suit new owners now I know that's probably a never-ending and impossible (laughs) question to answer Um, but if somebody came to you and said I can adapt my lifestyle and money's not an object etc but I've never ever had a dog before I'm completely inexperienced do you have sort of a, a particular breed that you like to fall back on? I think, again, it depends on the lifestyle of the owners. That's got to be the first thing. That's got to be the first consideration. I think Labradors are the number one top spot popular breed for the reasons that I've already said. They're quite versatile. They can be used in all sorts of situations. I'm really quite a fan of Golden Retrievers as well, if it's particularly that you want a family dog. If you want a dog that's super intelligent and super fast, then, you know, maybe you might go for a Border Collie, but you've really then got to put the energy and the enthusiasm in, as I've said already. It kind of depends. I suppose size of breed has got to be a consideration. You know, I know a lot Mm. of people like cockapoos because of the allergy issue. And if you've got people with allergies at home, but, you know, there are other types of crossbreeds out there, not just a cockapoo. You know, there's there's quite a few others. I mean, I've had Westie Poos come through class and (laughs) multiple. poos as well and for pretty much most things that have been crossed with a poodle come every poo yeah (laughs) yeah absolutely you know and and they also don't tend to shed because it's the poodle element that doesn't shed (laughs) I would say also I think in again personal experience trotting around the discover dog stands at Crufts um and if any listeners haven't uh, been to anything like that or been to the Discover Dog Show itself, um, it's basically a lot of little um, stands that are set up from A to Z. And most breeds have representatives there with their actual dog. So you go to uh, G if you want to have a look at golden retrievers. And then there's some people there that own golden retrievers or maybe even breed golden retrievers. And I found that, that those people on those stands are, are generally very honest as well. They've got nothing to, to gain out of um exaggerating or not telling you the whole truth and they will be quite honest with you if you say to them does this dog need a lot of exercise or is he quite high maintenance they will tell you and they will tell you exactly how it is and how what it is like to live with those particular breeds of dogs so I think from a personal point of view I think anybody that's looking to get a dog one of those sorts of shows or exhibitions hopefully when they're back on later in the year is definitely worthwhile going to attend Absolutely. Yeah. And um, just jogged a little memory of actually, you know, I had a a family with a seven year old daughter and they decided to, they said, oh, we're going for a spaniel. And immediately in my mind, I thought, oh, you know, really busy working parents, school runs, you know, and I thought, please, please not a high energy spaniel, please not like, you know, a springer spaniel that needs to charge through the undergrowth or run around lots. And and actually they went with a clumber spaniel. And uh, he, you know, when you look at that, as you say, you go to those stands and you look at the breeds and things, and he was just the most docile, um, (laughs) chilled out spaniel I've ever met in my life. (laughs) So yeah, absolutely. Really, that's, that's a really good one. Oh, brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Sarah. Absolutely packed full of information that I think really every potential dog owner should should have a listen to. It's been brilliant. Um, could you let our listeners know how they can find out more about different dog breeds to help them research their next furry family member? Have you got any pointers or tips or uh, information sources you would like to direct us to? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, we've mentioned it lots. Um, the Kennel Club UK site, make sure it's UK, not USA. It's slightly different, the American side. Um, that's your first port of, port of call because you can actually research by dog breed, just like we were saying. The shows and demonstrations, if they're on later in the year and you're not planning to get a puppy straight away. Um, there's lots of good breed books out there. You know, um, you can find those on many a good online shopping <laughs> um, sort of platform. Um, um, and, you know, and if need be actually chatting to family, friends, other people who have got pets, maybe, and you're thinking, well, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Or do you know anyone who's had this? Um, obviously, with family and friends, just be a bit careful because they might be a little bit biased. I love my huskies, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that my elderly father go out and grab one. Oh, 100%. Um, <laughs> I couldn't agree with that more. Yes, in my personal experience as well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, and just actually talk talk research you know there's loads on the internet but just be careful like everything out on the internet just be a bit careful and also actually have a chat to your local vets you know they're they're a good source of information and you know you can always phone them up or drop them a little email and say I'm considering getting this is there anything I need to be mindful of and, and see what their intake is or what their sort of perspective is as well because you know they'll see it certainly from that health side as well. Mm, lovely oh that's brilliant Sarah thank you so much for all that information that's been really good it's my absolute pleasure it's been lovely thank you all for joining us on our second voyage of the Pupcast we hope you've learned lots of top tips and feel more enthusiastic and excited than ever about you and your pet's next chapter don't forget that you can chat to us anytime at Nature's Menu on Facebook using at Nature's Menu or on naturesmenu.co.uk Nature's Menu is dedicated to the health and well-being of its pets and yours. Discover the world of raw and more by visiting naturesmenu.co.uk. The Pupcast podcast is offering an exclusive 20% discount to its listeners. Simply enter Pupcast20 at the naturesmenu.co.uk checkout.